Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and this is theCUBE Silicon Angle's continuous coverage of the O'Reilly Media Strata Conference live from Santa Clara, California. We have a great guest uh, coming on, uh, somebody who's been in this business for quite some time. Bradford Stevens is the CEO and founder of Drawn to Scale, and uh, my colleague David Fleur is back. Bradford, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much, it's a real pleasure, guys. Yeah, it's nice to meet you and, and good to have you here. So, uh, this is, uh, let's see, our, our third Santa Clara Strata, I think our fifth or sixth Strata plus a Dupe World, you know, they've merged in, so we've been watching this for quite some time now. You were mentioning off camera that you get, you've been at this since the beginning, one of the early you know, Hadoop practitioners, mm -hmm. so uh, it's come, come quite, a, quite a ways here. Yeah, um, I was lucky enough to be asked to help uh, organize this conference from the beginning, back when we didn't really know what big data was, and perhaps today still a lot of us don't know. Uh, and it certainly changed a lot. Um, I can tell you as sort of, you know, somebody who's traditionally moved from like hacker to engineer to CEO, uh, it's, it's really been an interesting growth at this um, in terms of both revenue and size. Like just the sheer amount of, for lack of a better term, I guess, energy that is both coming from the conference and just if you walked around the expo hall, the amazing amount of uh, cash people are pouring into uh, their big data problems. I've, I haven't seen anything like it, I guess, since the cloud days. Yeah, I mean, actually, you're talking about the practitioners pouring cash mm -hmm. in. I mean, we were seeing deals, n numerous deals, over yes. $50 million, $100 million mm -hmm. deals going on, not just from three-letter you know, government agencies. I mean, it's really starting to get uh, pretty serious, and I think that talks to the, the value proposition, the productivity impacts that, mm -hmm. that you can have. So, how does Drawn to Scale you know, play into that whole thing? You're seeing some really you know, strong themes around SQL and Hadoop, you're seeing the, the platform wars around the, the distros, mm -hmm. um, still a lack of you know, great apps. Um, exactly. But uh, let's talk about all those things. So start with sort of Drawn to Scale's you know, participation and angle. Sure. Uh, so yeah, you may have noticed, and this caught even us by surprise, I didn't think it would have moved this quickly, but this seems to be the year of SQL on Hadoop. <laughs> and uh, everybody here, has here. a SQL something on Hadoop, uh -huh. uh, which, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's a lot of different things. There's people with SQL interfaces to MapReduce, like Hive. There's folks like uh, Greenplum and Cloudera's Impala, which are data warehouses meant for internal facing analytical applications. And I think you've noticed there's now nine or 12 or 15 different distributions and data warehouses and <laughs> it's very, very crowded. Uh, what we're focusing on at Drawn to Scale is solving the key problem you mentioned of there's no apps on top of Hadoop. Mm. I can't take my legacy ERP um, platform and copy and paste that onto Hadoop. That doesn't make sense. I can't take my website and run it on top of Hadoop scale data. Uh, there's no database there. And databases are what everything is built on top of. So we have built Spire, which is the first application database for Hadoop. We're not really focused on analytics. That's, it's, a, it's a pretty solved problem, and we're going to leave that to the guys at Greenplum and Teradata and Oracle. What we're focused on is being an application database. Transactions, hundreds of thousands of reads and writes a second, full SQL support, you know, something that you would build a social network on, your telephone call management system on, Things about high volume and real revenue generating user facing applications. So how did you decide that this is what you wanted to build? You said you know, today there's all this buzz around mm -hmm. SQL and Hadoop, and which you must love. Did you predict it? Did you just have a passion for it? Did you, you know, see a problem that needed to be solved? Tell us how you, you, you take us back to the beginning. When I you wish said, I, I had I'm predicted doing it. Yeah. Our <laughs> marketing copy would be better <laughs> had I predicted this. Um, <laughs> I've, I mean, you know, a little bit about me. I grew up in Amish, Pennsylvania, like writing software on my 386 when I was eight years old. And for some reason, I've always loved crazy complex stuff. And there's really nothing more complex than a database. And I started my career at Microsoft and um, worked on SQL Server there. And the thing I saw at Microsoft and, you know, for the next several years of my career is that when something breaks, it's always the database. Um, when engineers complain they can't build some new feature that's really important, it's because the database is crashing, or it's because... Um, it doesn't scale. Yeah, it doesn't stand. And really, when you put too much data in a traditional database, it just falls apart. So around 2009, I said, all right, Google has solved this problem. Google has the unified platform that can hold petabytes of data, and everybody at Google 
writes their software on this one huge giant database. At the time, it's Bigtable. Now it's Megastore and F1. Uh, and then I looked at Hadoop and HBase. I said, Hadoop is a great tape drive. You know, I can <laughs> I can batch that. process my data in it. This is cool. <laughs> and then we've got HBase, which is great if I have a background in distributed systems and understand what ones and zeros I need to place where. But SQL is the Rosetta Stone for data. Why can't I have a SQL database with the scale of Hadoop and HBase that the average Rails programmer can just write an app on top of and suddenly you know, scale to petabytes of data and query it in milliseconds. It's very difficult, and to do that you have to build something from the ground up, but I think that's where the real value is. Mm. Mm. So you're, 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 you're competing in the space with people like uh, Couchbase or Aerospike mm -hmm. or uh, my MySQL, yeah. clustered MySQL. Exactly. So why, why do you think something different was needed? Uh, an, 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 another instantiation that MySQL is uh, yeah. pretty, pretty well known. So there's two key things, sort of two converging um, industries that were sort of happened upon. You mentioned there's the distributed NoSQL stores. And NoSQL, in some ways, is like no features, no understandability by developers. Uh, Aerospike is great, Cassandra is cool, HBase is a NoSQL store, but the average developer can't write code against it. There's no SQL. If I want to do something really simple like, you know, uh, I want to know who my top 10 customers were last month, there's not really a way to do that without writing a whole bunch of custom code on top of it. And likewise, if we look at things like MySQL cluster, even to an extent Oracle Rack, um, Operating a MySQL cluster at the dozens of terabytes, the petabyte scale, is practically a business of itself. And when you go to a distributed MySQL, what you don't learn right away is that you throw away much of SQL. You can't do joins very easily in distributed MySQL. You know, doing group buys or filtering out um, data becomes this huge difficult task because of the distributed nature of things. Um, in a lot of cases, and something we've seen with our customers, is that they come to us from a MySQL cluster where every query is running on every single machine in that box every time. And if you're doing something on like a Facebook scale or if you're a telecom and you're trying to do, you're trying to record all the records from your telephone calls, you can't have a system where every query hits every box every time. Uh, just the way databases were built 30 years ago, which is how MySQL, which is how Postgres are architected, just isn't compatible with the distributed world. So, uh, you said you were sort of, Bradford, joking about your marketing copy, but there's a great page on your website, Who We're For, and it just lays it out. You know? Thank you. You want real time, you want rich query, you got HBase, but you don't. You want rich queries, mm -hmm. you want scale, you got skills, but you can't leverage them, and that's really what, mm -hmm. what you guys are all about. Talk about some of the use cases that your customers are pushing it towards. I mean, is, for instance, is ad serving one? Is Absolutely. That, you know, I mean, clearly would be an obvious one. Others that you mm -hmm. can talk about? Yeah, so we'll start. Um, I think there's three big use cases and verticals that we're seeing. The first is uh, web apps and mobile apps. Mm -hmm. You know, I have millions of people accessing this application on my phone. Um, one of our cust public customers, Flurry, does this. Um, you know, I have millions of people accessing information from my phone, like I open my Angry Birds app and throw a bird. How many points do I have left? All that stuff. That's all backed by a giant database mm -hmm. somewhere. Uh, Flurry is one of the largest HBase users. They have two petabytes of data. And what they said is, you know, we need a way for developers to write mobile apps that use SQL and don't have to worry about the data backend. It just needs to scale as they have more and more users. That's really where we shine. Um, by being a SQL database, their customers who are developers know how to use us. And by scaling to be really large in real time, um, their folks can concentrate on writing mobile apps and not being database experts. Mm. Um, so web and mobile apps is a big one. Another big one you said is um, we're doing something with a large finance company on, um, it's sort of a take on advertising serving. It's a real-time recommendation engine and it's really cool. Uh, I usually have some prop to tell this story with because I have it so many times, but imagine I go to the Apple store and buy an iPhone. Um, with and buy an iPhone with my card. Uh, that transaction uh, is then recorded and they say, hey, you just bought an iPhone. Um, next door to you is an accessory store. Why don't you go next door, use that same credit card and get 20% off an iPhone case? 
Uh, so you can imagine these guys, they, they don't want to be a payment gateway anymore. They want to control commerce from end to end. And as you can imagine, filtering through hundreds of thousands of credit card swipes a minute uh, to return recommendations in a few seconds um, is not an easy task. You need a giant database just to handle that volume of data. Yeah, people talk about real-time or in-time data. I like David Floyer's definition the best, especially in this use case, is real-time is before you lose the customer. Yeah, customer <laughs> time, human time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and there is so much noise around what is real-time today, and even I feel guilty as an engineer for abusing it. Uh, for us, real-time we think of as a few hundred milliseconds, or before somebody thinks something is broken, or before they leave the website. A lot of other folks, as you've probably seen with the vendors, with Impala, with the new Green Plum thing, they think of real time as an analyst gets his answer in three seconds to a few minutes. Uh, that's an entirely different kind of real time. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic for analytics. We think of it more in terms of you know, web scale real time. Okay, so we had web apps and mobile apps, ad, ad serving, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a derivative of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a third? Did yeah, um, a lot of stuff going on in telecom, which is surprising, because mm -hmm. they, uh, they've always had big data needs and they've always been terrified of using anything that's not Oracle or DB2. Yeah. Uh, so one of our customers, who is a huge telecom out in Europe, said, um, we want to be a data company. We have so much amazing data. And right now, um, I mean, you've probably seen this, if you log into your Verizon billing statement, that's maybe updated once a month. Mm -hmm. Like everything in the telecom world is actually giant batch processes. And you know, when you're a customer service rep there trying to diagnose a problem, or you're a business user trying to see you know, uh, how many people are making calls from which departments and all that, you can't actually do that. Um, because that information is scattered across 50 different Oracle databases you know, across Europe. So what we're doing in the telecom field with the several customers is saying, hey, we need a database that scales that we can put all of our data into one place for because we want to build better customer service apps. Or we want to do better diagnostics. We want to do predictions. So you know, if there's a soccer tournament in um, Nice, France, uh, we want to know how many cell phone towers to build to support that. And traditionally, they would have to go get an analytics team together, query 20 different databases, and then make some kind of decision. But with, with our database, Spire, they're able to update all that data in real time, you know, look at the usage in real time, and build applications on top of that so they can make those predictions, so that they can manage their company better. So, so one of the things that I've been talking about is the, is the migration from the traditional transactional system, mm -hmm. which then puts all its data onto disk, and then weeks or later, you, you get it back again, yes. to combining transactional and analytics, essentially, exactly. in one pass through the data, and then making sure the metadata is held in, mm -hmm. in, in active memory. So is, is that the sort of model that you think is yeah. coming? And, and that's a, that's a huge change in the marketplace. What, what are the steps that uh, you think you can do to use up um, Oracle, for example, from mm -hmm. its uh, primary position in, that, in the uh, current stack? I don't want to say I'm usurping uh, Oracle in any way because they have way more much money than us and uh, <laughs> I don't want to get crushed yet. But I mean, what we're seeing is, and we see this at several of our, especially customers in the telecom field, they're being told, can you, can, can you stop spending time. so much yeah. money on Oracle? Um, mm. We're not getting out of it what we need to. It's not letting us scale. We feel really locked <laughs> in. And to your point, you know, people, uh, especially these larger organizations, data is siloed into lots of different OLAP and transactional databases. And so when you need to update information or make a decision or build an application, you may have to pull from 10 different databases. And the reason why, in the first place, there are different OLAP and transaction databases is traditionally we've had to have the one giant mainframe that has a database for a single purpose. But in a world where everything is distributed, you don't need to custom build super high efficiency uh, transactional and analytical engines because if I can have something more general purpose that's 5% slower, I'll just buy 5% more machines. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is this sort of convergence of this used to be transactional, this used to be analytical, and instead we want to put this data in one place so that we can build apps on top of it so our analysts can see what it is and not have to wait months uh, to get all the data into one place. And I think it's going to be a huge shift and it's because we're starting to build things to be distributed from the ground up. 
Bradford, great perspectives. Uh, we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining us thank on the Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I'd uh, love to have you back sometime. Absolutely. And uh, pick your brain some more. Uh, all right, and thank you, David Floyer, for sitting in. Keep it right there. We'll be right back with our next guest. I believe Ed Dumbill is, uh, is up next, and uh, we're going to wrap up the show. Uh, we got a few more guests. Pauline Nist is coming on as well from Intel, so keep it right there. We'll be right back. This is theCUBE from SiliconANGLE from Strata in Santa Clara. Right back. <laughs>